Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Signal or Noise. This is episode 19. Charlie Bolello here, and with me, as always, Peter Malouk. Peter, a lot of good topics today. We have to start out. Exciting news. You have a new book out, Money Simplified. It's available everywhere. We'll have a link in the show notes. First, to just before we dig into some of the concepts in the book, and there's many to talk about, I picked out a few. Just tell tell us why you decided to write this book. You've written books in the past. This is a little bit different. Why you decided to write it? Who is the audience? And what do you hope people get out of it? You know, I've written uh, you know a few books, and they're all you know longer and a lot of graphs and charts, but really getting into detail and why to invest certain ways, why to do financial planning certain ways, certain strategies. And I really wanted a book that was accessible. So when I give presentations, they tend to be very visual. I try to make sure that I'm really reaching every single person in the audience, trying to keep that advanced investor engaged, but also not skipping the basic building blocks and the logic behind the decision making for investing for somebody who's even starting out or just learning. And so I really wanted to write a book that like most of my family family would enjoy. They're all smart people, but they don't love investing. This isn't their day job and what they want to do and really wanted to speak to, to that audience. So whether it's people that are just, this isn't what they're doing day in and day out, or they're younger, or they're visually visual learners like a lot of people are, I really wanted to be the book about that. And I think it's so different than my other ones. I really like this one a lot. You can get through the whole thing in 30 minutes. And, and I, I think no matter what your investing background is, you are going to learn something. Yeah, no question. And this really speaks to me, as you know, because I kind of like charts and visuals. And I've come to understand that some people like to read, but many more people like to look at visuals. And that's something they really remember. And I really, when I first got the book, I was like, this is a great, I have my copy right here. <laughs> this is a great kind of coffee table book where you can kind of flip through it, constant reminders, and you have that imprint in your head of that particular chart that will help you in all different areas. So let's dig into a few of the concepts. I picked out a few here that we haven't really discussed. Some of them are top topical. This first one, very topical. And when you wrote this book, people weren't talking about new highs. We were in the midst of a bear market, right? But this is a fear that people often have. Stock market's at a new all-time high. You have this notion, buy low, sell high. You have this other notion that people say, what goes up must come down. So why shouldn't people fear the fact that the S&P 500 is back at an all-time high today? Well, this is an interesting time in history because it's two years since the market hit an all-time high. That's one of the longest periods in history. It's the longest it took a market to get to an all-time high since the 0809 crisis. But normally, the market hits an all-time high about once every 19 or 20 days. I mean, it's a very, very normal thing. Um, we're not surprised when getting a meal at a fast food restaurant goes up in price or getting a ticket into an amusement park goes up in price, but we're surprised when the, when the stock market, which is a reflection of all these companies, goes up in price. Inflation is a part of the stock market return, just as dividends and earnings are. It's very normal. It would be abnormal for prices of everything that we consume to go down, and it would be abnormal for the stock market to stay down over a long period of time. So, you know, people a lot of times go, oh, the market's back at an all-time high. Maybe I should take some chips off the table. And uh, the evidence suggests, uh, no, well, number one, that that happens all the time. But number two, that the the positive return going forward is still you know, over a one 12-month period, about 75%, just as it is if the market's not at an all-time high. Absolutely. And but let's show the data here. Let's show where we are historically. So this is 1957, 1,176 all-time highs. So clearly, hopefully, people back in 1957 <laughs> didn't say that was going to be the last all-time high. But as you said, it's been a little while. It's been two years since the last all-time high. Not a huge gap compared to that period from 2008 to 2012. That was a long period, no all-time highs in 2001 to 2006, none as well. But historically speaking, you're right. The market tends to hit an all-time high much more frequently <laughs> than every two years. And if we look at the data, this is, should really be all that people point to when it comes to all-time highs. And when people ask the simple question, well, what tends to happen following all-time highs? The simple answer is 
more all-time highs. And if we look at the returns, as you said, over the next year, almost indistinguishable from other periods of time. So there's, based on the data, there's absolutely no reason to treat this all-time high as anything different in, in the course of investments. Imagine, the, imagine that there's a correction. And in and, and every correction or bear market, people freak out. They go to cash. This time it's different. Imagine betting against a 1,160 all-time high winning streak, right? Imagine betting that this will be the one time the market won't recover when it's been the norm, um, you know, 1,200 times, right? I mean, it's just something not to bet against. Yeah, it comes back to that same concept we over, always talk about. Forget about how how many all-time highs is the S&P going to hit this year. That doesn't matter. It's it's uh, How many is it going to hit in the next 20 years? And there's likely to be many, many more because, as you said, inflation will be higher, growth will be higher, profits will hopefully be higher. And therefore, as long as the market isn't priced so extreme, right, in, in like a Japan-type scenario, then you should expect that earnings growth will propel the market higher. All right, second concept I want to dig into, stop checking your portfolio every single minute. This is an interesting one, the way you approach and talk about the study in here, because I think we're all familiar with the concept that if you look at your portfolio more often, you're likely to take more activity and more activity, as we know, tends to be adverse to performance because you're likely to get out at the wrong time. And we know market timing hasn't been helpful for investors. But the study you talk about here, very interesting in, in terms of the more frequent that people look at their portfolio, it seems like the more conservative they are in their portfolio allocation. As you show here, when they're looking at it monthly, they have more bonds than stocks in their portfolio, 59% bonds, 41% stocks. When they look at it only annually, 70% stocks, 30% bonds. So why is this important in the long run in terms of positioning for investors? Yeah, of course, the person who is going to own more stocks than bonds has a much higher probability of, of performing better uh, over a long period of time, like an overwhelming probability. And so it's interesting that the, the people that are more engaged tend to own more bonds. And one theory would be, well, they're more engaged, they get a little more nervous, they see the ups and downs, and it causes them to position more defensively, and they end up paying for it. And the person who's just ignoring everything because they're too busy seeing clients or patients or whatever it is that they're doing, just have other things to do, that person's going to outperform the person looking every month or every day. I just think it's an interesting uh, interesting way to look at in investing, that the more engaged you are as a group, the less likely you are to perform well. And I think last year would be a great example of if you looked at your portfolio monthly and some of the crisis that so-called crisis that we talked about. You had the banking crisis, you had the debt ceiling issue, you had obviously the war in the Middle East, and on and on and on. And if you didn't look at it at all, beginning to end, you would wake up at the end of the year, you had stocks up 26%, bonds up 5%, right? So 2023, perfect example of there's many crises that don't rise to the level of, of you should take action in your portfolio. But when you're looking at it monthly or Many people, let's be honest, probably look at it way more frequently than that. Right. It's going right. to lead to it's counterintuitive because we think, well, I should be checking, I should be monitoring it, but our emotions tend to get the better of us when that's the case. So number three, confirmation bias. And this is something no one's immune to here. And in investing, the danger, of course, is buying something. Really, what way I think about it, the biggest danger is 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 a concentrated position in a particular stock, or it doesn't matter, a sector, a fund. And now you're invested in that. And you're looking out, only looking for information that confirms that that's the right decision, that Tesla is the best stock, or this is the best sector, or this is the best fund. And so the way I approach it in terms of investing is to say, well, let's, let's assume that we're wrong, right? In that uh, initial uh, investment, that assumption. And the best way to protect against that, therefore, is to diversify. And when you have a diversified portfolio, well, now you you're, there's nothing other than saying diversification tends to work over time that would be bad to confirm that. And how do you approach it? And how do you find sources of information that kind of go against what you're thinking to, to just a reality check in terms of, but not just investing, but in general? 
Well, I think when people think about confirmation and bias in investing, they, they think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. But really, I mean, we all are very diehard in our positions. And that kind of the easiest litmus test for that that I like to use as an example is politics. So, I mean, if, if, if you're a Republican or conservative, let's say, you, you might watch Fox News, you might go to the Drudge Report online, you might read the Wall Street Journal. If you're liberal, you're, you may be watching CNN or MSNBC, you might be going to uh, HuffPost, you, you might be reading the New York Times, right? So we tend to just go and listen to stuff that already just repeats the stuff that we already believe all the time and kind of makes fun of all the stuff we don't agree with. That's just how it is. And if I went to somebody who we all have our political beliefs and I said, okay, well, these are your three hot button items. And I don't, you know, whatever they may be for somebody, you know, guns and war and, and uh, deficit spending, whatever it is. And I put the greatest speakers in the world uh, on the other side and had them all talk about why you're wrong about one given topic. You are not going to change. No one's changing their mind about anything. That's how powerful confirmation bias is. We are all certain, certain that we are on the right side of all of those issues. Investing is is very, very similar. You know, if we have, you own Apple stock and what are you going to do? You're going to go look for reasons to keep owning it. Why is it doing great? All of those things. You're looking for things that confirm what you already want to do. The heart decides, the mind follows. Um, and so it's a very powerful force. I remember reading an interview once with Warren Buffett where he talked about com combating confirmation bias. He looks at a company and says, "What you say, Charlie? If I'm, if I'm, this doesn't work down the road. Why did it not work? Right? You try to attack your position, but you have to be very, very deliberate about it and ask yourself: If I had cash today, what what would I do with the cash today? Would I go buy a million dollars of this one stock? If you would, well, then you're in the right thing. But it's a very hard bias, high, harder bias to overcome than most people realize." Yeah, once you're in that position, it's so hard. But you're right. If, when you wipe the slate clean, when people sell that, it's amazing how quickly they're not defending it anymore and they can right. move on mentally. And what a relief, I think, that is. We'll talk about stock picking a little bit, but in terms of not having to go out and do that every day, right? right. That's, that's the real danger of the sleep at night type of risk where you're constantly having to defend that position. Maybe it's right. Maybe it'll end up being the right position. In investing, the other difficulty is it's hard to come to a so-called truth, right? Because it's not just the facts. It's not just that Apple's selling more iPhones or iPads or, or it's, you know, its services revenue is going up. It's expectations. It's sentiment. It's all of that stuff. And that's a very hard thing to kind of get to a truth because what is the truth? How? what is the multiple it should trade at? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there's a correct answer to that, right, for any stock. So very difficult confirmation bias. And just go into it assuming and investing that you don't know the real answer. I think just having some humility will go a long way. So let's talk about number four. This is a fascinating one that surprised me, probably surprised a lot of people listening to this because you often hear about baby boomers, getting older is going to be a big problem. We don't have enough young people to replace them. And why is this a myth, Peter? And tell us why we're going to be okay in terms of demographics in the US. <laughs> well, I think people equate the US with Japan. And as you know, as this graphic shows, you know, when you ask people what they think, they think most people are over age 60. Uh, but in reality, we've got 88 million people that are 20 to 39. We've got over 80 million people that are 40 to 59, and we have 77 million people over 60. So the, the demographic trend is just fine in the United States. Now, it would obviously, the younger you skew, the better, because younger people are working and older people are on uh, the, the programs that uh, Social Security, Medicare, all uh, that side of the ledger, right? No longer paying taxes and, and, and taking it out as they rightfully deserve uh, to do because they've contributed for so long. But the perception of where we stand as a country is very, very different uh, from the reality. That, that could change, and there's, there's uh, indications it may change over time. But so far, that's not, what we're, that's not what we're seeing in the United States, even with the most recent census. Now, how about this, the top 10? You have this on the bottom there, top 10 most common ages in the U.S. Not a single one is above 60. So yeah. Kind of definitely surprised me. All right, so... You could fear other things, but fearing the demographic crisis, at least today, it doesn't appear to be 
as big as a problem as we're hearing it. And last one from the book that I want to talk about, this is something we often talk about, obviously, stock picking versus indexing. In terms of keeping things simple, right? this would probably be, from a portfolio standpoint, the number one thing that people can do, and it ends up being to their advantage as well, not trying to find that needle in the haystack and just buying the haystack. Yeah, I think, I mean, the S&P 500 lately has been the greatest example of that. If you've got an allocation of large company stocks, you bought the S&P 500, well, you got the top performers, you got the Magnificent Seven, and they all went absolutely bonkers, and they lifted up the return double last year what it should have been. This year, they're responsible for all of almost all of the return again. Someday that 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 will fade, and there will be something else that rises up and becomes the new uh, number one. In the past, it was companies like GE and Exxon Mobil and Southwest Airlines, and it's just there's always a new new er- narrative. There's always new giants coming. We can't identify them. They're much easier to identify in the rearview mirror. But if you own the basket, you've got you've got the winners. And a lot of people think, well, some of these stocks go down and some go up. But the the reason the math works out to buy the basket is if you get a couple busts, well, they go to zero. The most they can go down is 100%. But the winners, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Googles, the NVIDIAs, they can go up thousands of percent. And that's why they tend to lift up. That's why they lift up the the, the basket of securities return, because they can go up 10, 20, 30x. A stock can only go down 100%, right? And so they can offset a ton of losers and more. Yeah, and the data in terms of the percentage of stocks that actually contribute in the long run to performance is kind of shocking when you look at it. It's a very small percentage of stocks that produce the vast majority of the returns. And there's two ways you can approach that. The one way would be to say, well, if I just pick that small number of stocks, (laughs) then I'm going to kill it. The other way is to say, I'm unlikely to pick that small group of stocks, as we'll show in a little bit, because professionals haven't been able to to do that. And me, I have a job and I'm doing this maybe an hour a week. That's probably not going to do it. So just that understanding that you're unlikely to do it. And the only way you can guarantee owning the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons of the future is by owning everything. And so very interesting time here. Peter, because since you started in the business, there's there's it's just been an enormous gap that's been closed, right? It started out when you started out, it was the era of the star manager, right? Mutual fund manager and, and stock picker. That was all the rage. And just slowly but surely, that gap has been closed. And now finally, Morningstar just put out this data as of the end of last year. We now have passive funds for the first time in history with assets above the level of active funds. And just tell me about that transformation since you first started to today. Did it surprise you it took this long? And what do you make of this going forward? Is this going to continue? I don't see it going back in the other direction, but just give me your thoughts here. I, I'm actually logically surprised it took so long, but from a human nature perspective, not surprised at all, because there's so many people that think that they can, you know, they're, if you're better at one thing, you could be better at something else. And it just doesn't translate into at least security selection among big US companies, which is where most of the money is invested. And so I think what's really ch- flipped this chart is two things. One, the cost, low cost ETFs made this so accessible and easy easy for the retail investor. And second, the institutionalization of indexing. You're seeing indexing now in the biggest pension plans in the United States and some of the biggest retirement plans in the United States. And I think that big money is what what tipped it over to finally overtaking active. Right. So certainly a good trend for the end investor. And the proof is in the data here. Percentage of equity funds, and we could show this for any category it's the same data in the short run you may outperform even though it's still pretty low over a three-year period absolute return 79 percent of funds are outperforming five years 88 percent 93 percent over 10 years 92 percent over 20 years so the longer you go the less likely you are to outperform so this is the percentage of underperformance versus the s p 1500 over time and 
as an investor, this should, this should be a relief. It should be comforting because keeping things simple and not doing all that, like there's a f famous saying, uh, you know, from uh, CNBC uh, personality where he used to tell people, do your homework, do your homework. <laughs> no, you don't have to do your homework. You don't have to go and research that stock. In fact, the people that are doing it 18 hours a day, unfortunately, as we show here, they, they're not successful at doing it. So I think this is a huge win for the individual investor over the last 20 years. The fact that they're keeping more of their own money, right? It's less of it's going to active management fees and taxes and all the rest of it. And what a difference. So when you started out and you were talking about indexing, you were probably one of the few people promoting it. And now today, it's kind of common knowledge that this is what you should be doing. Yeah, I mean, when we started out, we we used to have to explain what ETFs were. I think we were the largest holder of ETFs in the United States in the 2000s. I think we probably still are today, is my guess, among all uh, uh, wealth management, independent wealth management firms. But it was a concept that had to be explained um, not that long ago. And so to see, you know, to see it overtake active is something else. Yeah, and it'll never... It'll never go completely in one direction because, no. as we've talked about, you're always going to have streaks in performance, whether it's due to luck or skill. So there's always going to be someone who's outperforming and people chasing mm -hmm. that outperformance. But I think just the younger generation is more comfortable with the concept that they don't have to pick stocks or pick managers in order to have a successful outcome in the long run. I think that's a big win. So, all right, five good concepts there. Money Simplified, we'll have the link in the show notes. It's available on Amazon, everywhere else. So check it out if you like charts, ton of good charts in there. Number two, I want to talk about, and this is a question, Peter, I get all the time. Charlie, what is the value of advice? Why should I consider having an advisor? Do I need an advisor? And the way I answer this, Peter, personally, is I say there's three reasons why having an advisor might help you in terms of having a better outcome than doing it on your own. Number one, and this is the one everyone focuses on, the portfolio gets all the attention. And the thing that we do at Creative Planning that's a little bit different is it's not a one size fits all portfolio. It's customized to you, right? Everyone has a different portfolio and that goes along with a plan. Right. So having a plan and sticking with it, that advisor is going to work with you. And it's not just investment planning, it's tax planning, estate planning, everything else. And number three, and this might surprise a lot of people. This is what I always tell people. This is probably the biggest reason for most people. You're so busy doing your job. You're you work so hard to save all of this money. This is your nest egg. You want to make sure it's secure for yourself, for future generations. Peace of mind is an absolutely enormous one. I never had any data to back this up, Peter, but Morningstar just did a study in terms of what are the most common reasons people keep a financial advisor. And this is important data because it's actual clients that they surveyed of financial advisors and they asked them, what's the number one reason? And number one seems to be that peace of mind category, right? People just feel better delegating that responsibility to someone who's an expert that's focusing on it every day, has your best interest in mind, is objective, right? isn't going to take concentrated positions or be subject to the same amount of emotions as you do. That was number one, 37% of people. And all the way down here, uh, t only 12% of people were returns. Yeah. And that might be surprising to people, but probably not to you. You still talk to clients day to day. And that kind of shocked me when I first, when we first met, you were flying somewhere to meet a client. And I said, you're still meeting with clients? I said, yeah, absolutely, Charlie. I mean, this is what I love to do. I'm going to continue to do it. And so give me your perspective in terms of this. And I'll tell you my view of, of why this actually makes sense in terms of people caring more about the quality of advice and peace of mind than the returns. Well, I just uh, was out of town yesterday with a team and saw three different clients. I'm going to see more today. And I think it's it's great because it keeps 
makes all of this stuff a reality. They're just sitting here, you know, theorizing. Uh, you know, you get to know what people are thinking about and what they care about, and just talk about what happens in those meetings. So, um, some of it is around, well, where do you stand today? So it's this accountability of, hey, have I remeasured where I'm at today, and have I revisited what I want? Like maybe before you were going to pay for your kid's school, but now you're going to pay for your nieces and nephews, or maybe you. Uh, we're going to retire. You needed two hundred thousand a year, but now you've changed your mind. It's three hundred, but you're going to retire later. So part of it is just this reassessment of where am I and what do I want? Because that is the first stage in portfolio construction: is what asset classes should I own? I mean, you can't have things in alternative investments if you need access to them in two two years. You shouldn't have things in stocks if you need access in one years. You shouldn't have money in bonds that you really need in ten years. So knowing where you are, what you want, a very big piece of this and that accountability and really going through it together and talking through the needs. Like some people don't know, what am I going to need in retirement? What will my health care costs be? How am I going to live? How do you, you know, arrive at that conclusion and then, you know, do the, the calculations to get there? I think the second component is optimizing the path there. So I know what I'm trying to do. I know what I'm trying to accomplish. I know the asset classes I should own, but you know, what assets should be in what accounts? Should I be tax harvesting in one place or another? When's the right time to rebalance? What should I be doing with my dividends? Should I be carrying margin interest or not today, given rates are different than they were two years ago? When should I have loans? When should I not? All of those pieces uh, help optimize things. And then you can get to another layer of the, the strategy around tax and law and, and titling and asset protection and making sure you pay the least estate taxes and get the most bang for your buck with, with charitable giving. But I think even from an investment standpoint, you should perform better if you have a competent advisor, you know, than you would on your own, who's really even doing not even all of that stuff, but some of those basics. And I think you put all that stuff together and then you also, you know, get you know, some of your time back and some peace of mind. You know, that's the starting list, I think, of some of the things that can can make a difference for people. Right. And when, when I think about the return aspect, and again, it gets a lot of attention in what I like to say is if people are coming in with the question, are you going to outperform the S&P 500? That's likely going to be a failed relationship for any advisor and any client. And the reason we know is that, yeah, you could try to outperform the S&P 500, but to do that, you're going to have to take a higher level of risk. You have to take probably concentration risk, and most likely you're going to fail. So that's a situation where it's just a lack of education going in. As you said, the returns have to be good. They should be better than what you could achieve on your own, all else equal. But if that's the only factor that you're going into, I think that's probably a bad reason right, to hire an advisor, especially when we're talking about all these other things surrounding it that aren't just about returns and talk about thinking about taxes, thinking about... Uh, what healthcare plan to have and creative planning. The awesome thing about it is it's not just an investment manager it has experts in all of these different areas. So if you're in that meeting today or, or whenever, and there's a question that you can't answer very quickly, you can go to someone and get to that right answer. Is that that's pretty huge in terms of being able to offer that. I know that was one of your plans going into the past few years, trying to round out all of these ancillary services that end up being very important at the end of the day. Right. I, I think two parts. I think one, if somebody's goal is to try to beat the market, I think it, I do think it is possible, but you, to your point, you increase risk. So you're going to be all equities and private investments. And so you're going to have some, probably some illiquidity and you're going to have, you know, obviously equity risk, right? You're an owner across the board. We're excluding all the other asset classes and sub asset classes. It doesn't match a lot of people's goals. But it's something that you know some people uh, aspire to do, and there's a way to increase the probability of, of making that happen. But from a financial element, there's a lot of things that that people want help with, whether they're concerned about ass, you know protecting their assets, or they're concerned about you know how to navigate Medicare, or um, looking at the coverage on their home and auto and umbrella coverage, and are they doing the right thing there, or they need to update a healthcare power of attorney, or a tax strategy, or an audit, or all, having all of those things in house, I think, is helpful. They just, you know, our clients know if I need help with one of these things, I'm just going to call and my person's going to figure it out for me. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So if you're listening to this, you're thinking about an advisor, you have an advisor, you want a second look, reach out to us. I'll have a link in the show notes. We're in all 50 states, over 200 billion assets under management and advisement. 
and we're here to help. And you might even get Peter in a personal meeting. I can't promise that, but <laughs> that's available as well. Very rare for a CEO of a 2000 employee company, Peter, I would say, to still be on the ground doing the day to day. But I think it adds a tremendous amount of value. And like you said, what could be more important than what the actual client cares about and just being in the know is just enormous on that front. Okay. So three lessons from the last bear market. It's official. Bear market's over. Everyone's moved on. New bull market. I want to reflect a little bit and talk about a few lessons that we learned from this bear market or relearned because many of these lessons are timeless. Number one, and this is often shocking for people, the stock market is not the economy. Just because the stock market goes down doesn't mean that there's an economic recession. It could mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. And we saw that once again now. We know this in hindsight. Obviously, we didn't know as we were going through it. But many people were saying, obviously, in 2022, this has to be a sign of a recession. The S&P is down 28%. But once again, no recession. We're, we just got fourth quarter GDP, 2023. Up again, beat expectations again, above 3%. No recession. And this joins a long list here of bear markets without a recession. So 2018, 2011, 1998, 1987. And the important concept for people to take away from this is that the stock market isn't everything. There's so much to an economy. And the stock market itself is more of a reflection of real-time sentiment. And changes in sentiment can happen for a number of reasons. One of them could be the economy. But as we learned, it could be inflation, it could be interest rates, it could be any number of things that people are worried about. And I know you have seen this data probably in the past, but did you think while this was going on, this is probably a recession? Well, I think, you know, I, I had no idea. I think that, uh, and I wrote a letter about a year ago saying, okay, we got the inverted yield curve. Everyone's saying there's going to be a recession. It doesn't mean that's so. And it wasn't that I knew there wasn't going to there would not be one. It's that I, I did, had high conviction. No one had any idea if there would be one or not, including uh, me. The stock market is correlated to earnings. It's just correlated into anticipated earnings, right? So if you we were looking at when, when the market was you know, going down in 2022 in anticipation of a recession and most of 2023 down in anticipation of a recession, it was down not because earnings were lower or there was a recession. It was down anticipating the recession. And it was wrong. And as soon as it realized, hey, there's not a recession, it quickly recovered. You saw small cap stocks go up 30% in a matter of weeks. The S&P 500 rallied over 20% in a matter of weeks. Once it saw, hey, we got through this without a recession. Now the Fed's coming in and lowering rates. Here we are. Maybe we did get the soft landing. So the market will eventually eventually get it right. The, the key word being eventually. And it's because it's anticipating the future and the future's not totally predictable. That's right. And in terms of predictability, this is an important one to investors to focus on. No one rings a bell at the bottom. And this is a chart that was in your last book, the Five Mistakes book. And this is just an updated data point. And we didn't know it at the time, in October 2022, October 12th, that that would be the low. But as we learn time and time again, this is the reason why people who said in 2022, let me just wait until it's clear that the bottom is in before I buy. Let me wait till inflation comes down, until we know that there's no recession. And this is really why you can't wait, right? Because the market, when it, for, as you said, when it, when it comes to the understanding that that bad news is not going to impair earnings and earnings came back, roaring back last year very quickly, well, very quickly the market reprices on the upside. And it's very difficult talking about that confirmation bias. If you were bearish, you sold out in 2022, and you're like, this is going to be a recession. This is going to be 1970s inflation. You're just finding there's many articles and many things you could go out right now and find that that's still the case. Like It's coming. Now you're in a difficult position. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it turns, it turns quickly. Whenever someone says, oh, I'm going to wait for things to normalize, that's too late because the market's going to make up make up the gap very very fast. This is a great chart as an example of that. You can't, like you said, the no one's ringing the bell at the bottom, and because of that, by the time you absorb that things are okay, it's too late. Yeah, and, and speaking of which, that nobody rings a bell. I put out this poll 
like a week after the low in October. And I pointed out, I gave people a little evidence here that October tends to be a pretty good month for market <laughs> bottoms. And it talks about, you know, all these other years where it's bottom. But when I polled people, there was still obviously so much negativity. They said, no, that wasn't the low that we were going to hit lower lows ahead. And as we now know, only in hindsight, that wasn't the case. Yeah, and this is 65% of your Twitter followers who are generally more, you know, way more educated and way more optimistic <laughs> than, I, <laughs> Thank than you. I think, you know, the general public. So that just yeah. shows you how hard it is to predict the bottom. I, th I think you're probably right about that. I can't tell you the number of conversations I had from people in 2022. And most people don't often talk about markets unless it's at extreme. But around this time, people people were talking about I bonds and cash yeah. and, and just anything other than being in the stock market, right? It was just, yeah. okay, inflation's here. I'm not keeping up with inflation. And let me, let me, let's, let me just be in something safe until things get better. And nobody can adjust that quickly in terms of changing your mind, which is why not acting based on that type of interpretation. Is probably the best thing you could do. Number three here, every time is different. And early on in the bear market, what I did was show this table and show how important it is for investors to understand that you're not going to find that perfect analog. And what everyone was asking when it became clear, market's going to go down here, it likely will continue to go down. This is early 2022. And what I said at the time is, just look at the variation in terms of these historical bear markets. 2020, you have a one-month bear market takes the market down 35%. Then you have 2000 to 2002, 31 months cuts the market in half. How is it possible for you to know which one is, is it going to be like? Some of them had recessions, as we showed. Some of them don't. This ended up being, Peter, interestingly, kind of like your median bear market, right? In mm -hmm. terms of decline, in terms of how long it took to recover, 38% back to new highs. But there's no way of knowing this going into any bear market. We could have a bear market start tomorrow. We know it's out on average every four years, but you can see here we have one 2018, 2020, 2022. We had three in essentially four years. That's, that's pretty rare. I don't think that's we have any precedent here going cool. back in history for that, yeah. which is the perfect point. Yeah, the perfect point. And they're so different. You know, one was a, a, a existential crisis, like the first one since the Great Depression, really questioning can the infrastructure hold very yeah. s severe, deep, widespread re recession. The second one was the fastest drop, uh, 34 or 35% drop in stock market history. And the third one was one of the longer bear markets of recent times. So it's all different different ways, all unpredictable turnarounds. The only thing you can say, and this is what I say during any bear market, is when you have a big drawdown, if you have 10, 10 years or more, your odds now are in your favor. You actually tend to have better 10-year, 20-year returns when you're in a big drawdown than yeah. other time periods. And you have no way of knowing if it's going to stop at 28%. No one seemed to think that in October which is why you can't shut it off. You can't, that automatic buying that we always talk about, keep it going. Maybe even accelerate it in a bear market, regardless of the fact that you don't know when it's going to end and how deep it's going to be. Okay, lessons from the bear market. Let's move on to books. Obviously, everyone should first read Money Simplified. We <laughs> talked about the reasons for that. But Peter, you have this book here, The Gift of Influence, Tommy Spaulding. Tell me what you liked about it. What was the takeaway? So a friend of mine gave me this, this book, and uh, I really loved it. In the beginning, the author talks about the average person, and I don't know where they get the statistic, encounters, I can't remember if the number, 17,000 people or 18,000 people in their lives, and they leave an impression on all those people. They influence them uh, one way or another. And he just says, think about, you know, you're leaving the earth, and the first thing you do is you go into a stadium, and there's all those people. That's 17,000, 20,000, whatever the number is. And they're going to be cheering you or they're going to be booing you or what are they going to be like? Like what how, you, everyone has influence. You don't get to choose. It's kind of like when a sports player goes, well, I'm not, I'm not a mentor. Well, you are, you just, you choose to be a good one or a bad one, but you, you know, people are observing and modeling your, your behavior. And so I think the influence is the same way. 
everybody we encounter, we're influencing them one way or another. And if we got all those people together, what would be the consensus? And, and it just makes you a little bit more thoughtful about the impact you have on everybody you interact with day in and day out. Cool. Easy, and easy quick in- read. Awesome. I, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. And you interact, I would say, Peter, with way more than the average person. Definitely way more than me. I'm probably at the lower end <laughs> of the scale. You're at the way higher scale. Yeah. This is the uh, at median person knows 472 other people. On average, people know 611 others. But most of that average is driven by a small percentage of people who know a ton of people, 1,500 plus. You're probably in multiple thousands. What struck me, we had this event last year, Connect, and I started talking to people. And whenever people would talk about you, Peter, the first thing they said was, you had this uncanny ability of remembering not only their names, but spouses' names, sometimes parents' names. So before we talk about how many people you think you might might know, is, the, is there any trick to that? What is, what is the secret? We have, we have 2,000 employees now at Creative Planning. Maybe we'll do a test on the next <laughs> episode. We can run through. I'll show a picture. You tell me the name. But what's your, what's your secret to knowing so many of these people? I mean, it's hard for most people to remember the names of 30 people. Well, I think it's if you think about like if I you know get an Uber, you leave an Uber and someone says, this is my name. You say that you, most people are even listening. You know what I mean? So like, the first thing is just like actually pay attention. I mean, that, I and I say that in all seriousness. I think most of the time when people are encountering people, it's it just... Hey, our brain can only take so much. And I mean, who cares? You know, they just move. And and so one yeah. is, I really do think that makes an enormous difference. Like if you're at an event and somebody says, this is my wife, Mary, and you, and you like, okay, this is Mary versus just like ignoring it and moving on. That by itself makes a difference. I think second, meeting the people. I mean, before we hire, um, I meet them. And so that, I mean, obviously that helps a lot, right? So I'm having a conversation. It's usually uh, brief, but I'm getting to see them and talk with them. And I think that helps. And there are all kinds of things, you know, using names when you talk to people and, and so on. But it really starts with just some minor level of intentionality. And I think if you're interested in people and you want to make the, the most minor effort, I think it's something that, that a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of people can do. So awareness. 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 Anthony DeMello. I read the book, <laughs> by the way. I What'd was you ready think? for it. Were you ready for it? it? I think I think so. Okay. I had to read it twice, to All be right. honest. Yeah, I, think, so. like, I read it, I finished it, and I, I read it again. Very cool. different book. So yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. But yeah. yeah, that concept, it's hard. And you know, for me, don't let that first interaction, because often, like you said, you're talking, you're thinking about something else. Don't let it go to the point where you're seeing now a person three or four times. Now, I can't ask them for the person's name. Right. <laughs> Make, don't, like In the first interaction, what was your yeah. name again? That yeah. goes, that's okay, right? But the time you, you're meeting them for the 10th time, right. now, no. uh, now okay. it's too late. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my book, Peter, The Boys in the Boat. Have you read this book or heard? It's actually a movie now. This is coming a common theme, the books I'm reading. I have not. But this is like your third book that's a movie now, right? So I yes. don't have to read the books. I can just watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I haven't seen the movie yet right. for any of these books. So I've, I have a lot of uh, watching to do, but... What a story here. This is uh, the 1936 Olympic team uh, for crew. And I don't know anything about crew, first of all. And so that all of that was fascinating, lear- learning about you know the intricacies of it. But what a backstory. What an underdog story. I mean, every great sports movie or book or, is always an underdog story. You root pulling for the guys, the unexpected. You think like the miracle on ice. The U.S. beat the Soviet Union, things like that. But this had that kind of feel to it. Nobody expected anything. University of Washington rowing team. And it just goes through the their trials and tribulations, like through the Depression era before that. And it focuses on a few characters. Just an awesome, heartwarming, overcoming of adversity story uh, that has a positive ending. I won't spoil uh, the ending uh, for everyone, but just unbelievable uh, uh, what these, what these guys accomplished and, and what a team effort, a team sport that you don't realize how everybody has to be in sync. And that was the ultimate thing. These guys knew each other so well, they were able to, uh, just produce a result that couldn't be matched by really anybody. And, um, so I recommend that 
a hundred percent. And speaking of underdogs, I was thinking about this when I, I, I was talking about this book here. The Kansas City Chiefs are underdogs somehow in the Super Bowl. I just saw that headline and I said, This this is crazy. Like, and as a Mets and Jets fan from New York, I never have any skin in the game in terms of watching the Super Bowl or the World Series. So my default is to root for the underdog. So I expected to be rooting for the 49ers. Right. Now I have to root for the Chiefs. Uh, is- <laughs> I, I can't believe. I mean, I, I got to say, I mean, this playoff run has been surprising to me, you know, and I, as a huge Chiefs fan. And and but after that last win, I just don't know how we're how the Chiefs are underdogs. Um, I don't know. You know, obviously, San Francisco is very, very good, but I just surprises me. And I don't I think there's something like if you've bet on Mahomes as an underdog in the playoffs, you've never lost or maybe ever he's been an underdog. You've never lost. It's just yes. seems like a crazy. Um, a, they must love that. Right? Yeah. I mean, to just yeah. oh, well, he's got, they've got to absolutely love it. And I'm going to use that as as fuel. I'm curious uh, if the line has moved since it came out, like if it's tightened or not, or if it's. They really... said the article headline was it moved. It was started at two and a half, and I think it's at one now. That, okay, and, and that so makes who knows? Sense. Maybe there'll be favorites. I'll end up, but right. I'll stick with the Chiefs. Yeah. They were the original underdog, and it just surprised me. You have the best, clearly the best quarterback, and yeah, and hand, and I best, think he, best he, tight end, best receiver in Kelsey. And, um, and the X factor, and the experience, and they, and they and they handily won, and San Francisco really should not have won, you know, the uh, against the Lions. Yeah. And so to me, that's that's the. And if we were playing the Lions, we'd probably been, you know, for some reason, six point favorites or something because they don't right. get any respect either. So I, I'm surprised. We'll see. It's going to be another. Are you going to the game? No, I've never been to a Super Bowl. Have you? Okay. No, I no. I actually I like I yeah. like watching football with a you know a family and friends on a big TV with a bunch of really bad, bad yeah. for you food. And, uh, someday I'd love to go to one, but I, it's, I'd be giving up something. I think I would enjoy more. Yeah. Agreed. You definitely get, you definitely want view the game better, right. In, yeah. in your house. But, um, so you said X factor. Were you talking about Taylor Swift there? Well, that Jesus. too. No, no. But I mean, just there's just that look. They've got <laughs> they're in everyone's heads. It's just like when people would play yeah. Brady. I mean, that yeah. counts for something. Like you, it's hard to play. I think you saw it with the say the. I mean, with Baltimore, Kansas City, and with the Lions and and Forty ers I think the difference was who who was in whose head. You know what I mean? Like when Detroit was like, we can't lose this game and was, they just, they, they lost it. And Baltimore, I yeah. think it felt like the underdog and it was driving them, you know, it, 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 they just made mistakes because the way the chiefs did against Brady, uh, just because he was in their head, you know? And I think that, that factor is a big difference and the chiefs are in the winning side of that factor. Yeah, no question. So, I'd be surprised if they didn't win. And yeah. as long as they're the un- underdog, they have my support. <laughs> Hopefully, I think it's going to be a good game. So yeah. you never know that going in, but yeah. I think it's going to be a good game. All right. Signal or noise. We have an interesting one here because, and this has never happened before. And something to this extent got a lot of attention when I posted this on Twitter or X, S&P 500 at an all-time high and we've talked about all-time highs and <clears throat> while there's not any signal on there you're likely to be higher a year from now but how about this at the same time the S&P 500 is an all-time high you have the Russell 2000 small cap index down 20%. So we've never seen a spread this wide in history. Never seen the small cap still in a bear market with the large cap indices at all-time highs. The little arrow here of the three other time periods that had the biggest spread, none of them were showing 20% declines, 85, 91, 1999. But what do you make of this? I think I, I can probably guess your answer, but a lot of people, when I posted this, said, this is not good. This, is, this, this can't be good. The average stock is not performing. It shows weakness underneath the market. And their assumption is that this is going to converge with large caps going down. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I obviously totally disagree with that, you know, general consensus. And I think that just like bear markets always recover, I would look at the small cap index as eventually recovering. And I view it the opposite. Um, you had these big 
uh, S&P 500 companies lifting up the index. But in reality, we still had a bear bear market going that was going to recover. At, at, it, at most, it's inactionable completely. Um, the gap is not something you can say, hey, I'm going to overweight or underweight uh, anything based on that. Okay, let me give you the data here. And this is going to shock a lot of people, I think. April 1999, you have the Russell 2000 and a 19% drawdown over the next year while the S&P is at an all-time high. Next year, S&P gains 14%. Russell 2000 gains 36.5%. So clearly not bearish there. Obviously, there was a peak in 2000, but just looking at the one-year returns, not bearish. February 1991, next year, S&P gains 12%. Russell 2000, 35.5%. So once again, not bearish and actually more bullish for small caps than large caps. And January 1985, S&P gains 17% over the next year, and Russell 2000 gains 18%. So all three of these indices, Russell 2000 outperforms. Stocks are higher over the next year. And I look back in history, and I said, with the S&P 500 at an all-time high, Russell 2000 in a 10% or more drawdown, there was 40 different times, Peter, that this happened. And these are the returns over the next year. On average, 15% for the S&P 500, 25% for the Russell 2000. So, and every single time S&P 500 was higher over the next year. So anything could happen, right? (laughs) This has never happened before. So maybe over the next year, market will be down. But if you're just playing the odds, it definitely seems to just suggest that it's not likely to converge with a new bear market here for the S&P 500, it's more likely to converge actually with Russell 2000 at some point, we don't know when, but at some point joining the S&P 500 at all time highs and maybe even outperforming, which we've been saying for forever, for 13 for small years. caps yeah. and forever. <laughs> it's gonna, it'll happen someday. So what's your, what's your bet? And we'll revisit this in a year. We're going to see Russell 2000 catch up finally. Well, I would say yes. It's this this AI revolution that throws a wild card in it, but I'm still going to bet yes. And I having same no here. idea that's going to be my best. Sa- yeah, same. Here. I'm going to go with the odds, and we'll come back in a year and see if the both of us look foolish or if the odds were were correct. And and the AI thing, you're right, is the X factor. But once again, the expectations there are just so incredibly high that you have to meet those expectations, beat those expectations to sustain it. So, all right, with that, we'll end it right there. Peter, great episode, covered a lot of ground. Thanks everyone for joining us on Signal or Noise. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. It's important because the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm measures that and they'll push out the video, the more likes and subscribes it gets. And we're also available on Apple and Google and Spotify. So check us out there as well. And we'll see you next time on Signal or Noise.